listening to Mito Life Radio. This is episode 86, and today we're speaking with Mr. Keith Littlewood of Balanced Body Mind. Keith is also known as Tomo Littlewood on social media. He's been involved in the health and fitness industry for over two decades. He has a master's degree in endocrinology. He's been studying thyroid hormone, estrogen, serotonin, and really just breaking down all the misinformation out there about hormones and what supports the body's hormonal balance. In this interview, we have a pretty extensive Q&A, and my listeners ask Keith a lot of different questions. Um, he elaborates on fish oil, making chemotherapy more effective, how to lower hemoglobin A1C, his thoughts on blue zones and longevity, uh, how to fix adrenal insufficiency, uh, what does it mean when you get brain fog triggered by coffee, uh, a lot of information on thyroid hormone therapy. Someone asked about levothyroxine. Can they stop it cold turkey and heal with diet? Uh, any tips for type 1 diabetes? Thoughts on cigarettes? Is rice bran estrogenic? His favorite supplements? Uh, how does ascorbic acid and sodium ascorbate deplete copper? Uh, cholesterol? and its effect on male hormones in the immune system, uh, his thoughts on methylene blue, how to increase energy in the cell. I really loved his information on thyroid hormone and taking it exogenously. I think he had a lot of interesting things to say about that. And I personally take uh, ancestral supplements, desiccated thyroid, uh, pretty consistently. And I feel like if the nutritional backing is there, then there's a huge benefit to that. But if you're confused about thyroid hormone or you want to learn more about it, this is definitely the episode to listen to. So here we go. Here is Keith Littlewood. All right, we're here with Keith, a.k.a. Tomo Littlewood. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming on. I found you through Instagram, I think, close to a year ago when I was getting into this whole thing of uh, the bioenergetic view of health and, and the metabolism. And uh, people would call it repeat inspired, but it's so much bigger. It's so many different people. Um, there's a lot of great uh, people in the space that have been sharing information for a, a long time. Uh, Keith Deering and Josh Rubin really love their info. And, and um, it's just cool to see people like you helping people and putting this information out there that I believe is kind of being suppressed. I mean, there's so many kind of industries, uh, give the SSRI industry and the Omega-3 industry and so many industries that have a ton of money um, don't really want a lot of this info to, to get out there. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. I mean, that's, that's part in reason why I decided to go off and do a master's degree in, in hormones uh, primarily because I've been reading a lot and, and uh, you know accepting what was in the books and obviously Ray's put a substantial body of work together but I thought it'd be nice to kind of get a, a better depth to, to endocrinology and hormones and also the opportunity to study with doctors to see what they were doing and why they weren't really looking at some of the things that are talked about especially from a a nutrition and environmental perspective, which I guess for a lot of physicians is hard for them to 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 understand or qualify in any way. Uh, and what became apparent studying studying with them is that that there's little little information on nutrition and, and its influences, let alone you know inheritance, environment, stress, and the only thing that tends to come across is oh perhaps there's a genetic disorder, uh, and obviously every, everything between that is is just lost in translation to the average person. So uh, it was really interesting. Uh, it's taken me a while to, to get reasonably fluent with, with some of Ray's work. I've been reading stuff for about 10 years. There are plenty of other people that know way more than me. Um, but it, it was nice to just take, be able to kind of mix it together. And 
look at what he's done and, and, and look at some of the references that he's put together, you know, St. Georgie, Gilbert Ling, Katharina Dalton, Cellier, all, all of the others, I'm trying to come up with my own uh, way of helping people. I, I, I used a lot of functional medicine before and I, I've, I've quickly became disillusioned with that because one, it takes you into a, a, another form of reductionism and it's pretty expensive for a lot of people. And I've seen people that go to the same practitioner and they literally just roll through tests, roll through tests over six months to a year, spend a lot of money and, and, uh, and at the end of it, still at a loss of why they're still suffering from fatigue, can't sleep, can't have a baby, menstrual irregularities, pain, low libido, and, and, and the, the gamut of symptoms that go with it. Wow. So with what you learned, like Gilbert Ling and Albert St. Georgie and Hans Selye and Ray and all these people, how congruent was it um, to what you learned um, with your master's degree was like, is all this information like almost 180 to what you were taught in conventional school or? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the standard books you get are your standard big, you know, endocrine books that are basically saying there's a, a genetic link to some disease. There's virtually zero um, leverage on nutrition. I mean, you know, I still come across and one of the other th reasons why I decided to do this, I was hoping to have, have better conversation with some physicians about what's going on. Uh, and even the concept that TSH, for example, is this gold standard accurate marker. And I'm seeing this with a lot of clients in Australia. And if the TSH comes back normal, they will not entertain looking at a T3, total T3, free T3, whatever. It's just this dogmatic belief that that test is is a is a, a useful indicator of what's going on physiologically so that there's plenty of dogma in, in in what's going on from that perspective um and, and still if you look at all the other aspects whether it's you know uh, hypercholesterolemia high cholesterol blood glucose issues hypertensive issues they're still dealt with in this kind of very reduced mechanism um without understanding that thyroid hormone permeates every level of, of physiology and function and there are very clear cases where when you make someone new thyroid and normalized thyroid function that a lot of these cases get better but then you kind of get pulled into the argument of saying well there are these studies from synthetic uh, luvothyroxine t4 that haven't shown that effect but it's like well that's great. You've got a, a cohort of people. You have no idea what they're eating. You have got no idea if they're eating appropriately. No, no idea what environment they're in because these st things aren't, aren't, aren't considered as confounding variables. And then expecting a synthetic T4 to work the same as, you know, perhaps a, a complete thyroid hormone like a, a NDT or even a T4, T3 combo or even T3 in isolation, which is which I find mind boggling that, you know, it's just a one way street when it comes to, to thyroid physiology and it's uh, it's analysis. Uh, and that's kind of what's pushing me on to do my PhD, which I'm lining up for for next year or the year after is to, to, to look at why exposing a, a, a population. This is going to be in, in rats, for example, and looking at, at exposing them to pollution and particularly fine particulate matter which has a really disturbing effect on the thyroid axis and the adrenal axis and the the, the neuro, neuro neurological function what happens to the thyroid hormone receptors and what happens when you give them a t4 versus say a t t4 and a t3 combo or just t3 in isolation so the idea is to go and look at thyroid hormone receptor expression oxygen consumption and see if there's a clear difference between this and i like to think that 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 research might have an effect on how how people are looking at thyroid hormone analysis because I think we see that TSH does appear completely normal perhaps but looking at ox oxygen consumption and uh, thyroid hormone receptors may be expressed differently and plus looking at a more complete solution perhaps by combining T3 might have a better outcome and and that's my motivation is to to hopefully provide uh, a study that can maybe go and be looked at and say well, maybe we're not looking at thyroid hormone physiology appropriately. And perhaps, you know, stress and pollution is a key driver of why we're seeing high heart disease, you know, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, hypertension and cancers. That's really awesome. That's exciting. Um, I was in the, uh, unfortunately, omega-3 industry years ago. And 
uh, I got out of it once I learned this information and it blew my mind that, that polyunsaturated fatty acids, specifically HUFA is highly unsaturated fatty acids, which I think you've written blogs on, on your website, um, that they, they block thyroid hormone production, conversion, transport, and utilization. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, uh, from, from what I've seen. And bearing in mind, if anybody t t tries to do a Google search on, on polyunsaturated fatty acids and DHA, you have to wade through a vast amount of pro-industry literature on it. Um, and you have to look at different subjects like, uh, I don't know, like pyroptosis, programmed cell death, the use of DHA as a, a, a chemotherapy adjunct, because... You know, they're not just from from a a, a thyroid hormone perspective. It, it's been shown decades ago that like DHA in excess, for example, even moderate amounts can inhibit the the, the expression of thyroid hormone receptors. It can bind to transthyretin, so one of those primary thyroid carriers um, that should carry retinoid binding proteins. You know, vitamin A and T four just like pollutants like uh, PCBs and bisphenols can actually disrupt that carriage, hijack it. And DHA does exactly the same thing. Um, and this is what can make thyroid kind of uh, physiology and analysis quite problematic. But I, again, like what, what you've seen and, and written about and talked about is, that, you know, the concept that it's protective is, is one lost on short term studies that are showing specific effect that confer a cardiac risk protective. But that cardiac risk, like lowering triglycerides and lowering LDL isn't necessarily protective. It just appears in an algorithm against a cardiac protection to be protective. So you have to wade through all that literature, like uh, omega indexes, omega three to six balances. Uh, and, you know, one of the key things when you look at, say, the phospholipids uh, and that, you know, those kind of structures within the cell cell membrane that interact with the proteins is that it, it's quite clear that cholesterol is the protective factor there. Uh, I was looking at a study the other day that showed that if you depleted cholesterol, the actual uh, part of the membrane became much less flexible. Uh, and there's, but there's this assumption here that you need to flood this kind of cell membrane area with kind of these unsaturated fatty acids for membrane permeability. But yet this membrane permeability might actually have nothing to do with the, with the phospholipids. And, and the, the, unfortunately, if there's a high amount of unsaturated fatty acids there, it appears that the proteins tend to be doing most of the communicating. Thyroid hormones, for example, can slide quite easily through that structure. And thyroid hormones also act as antioxidants within that kind of area as well. So um, the interactions between thyroid hormones and vitamin E tend to be quite synergistic. But they need to be higher when you have this, this abundance of omega-3 fatty acids, which, as you know, they decay very rapidly. They promote lipid peroxidation, increase superoxide dismutase, and end up damaging the structure and the aerobic, aerobic producing metabolism around them. So I, I, I still find it. Um, I can understand why some people kind of promote that narrative, but they're looking at these very long uh, short term consequences compared to the long range order and the decay of the bi biology and particularly the aerobic system as a whole in, in that region of the cell and the cell, uh, the cell itself. Wow, that's, that's awesome. And I think people also look at, you know, omega threes having 20,000 plus studies like I did and saying, Oh, wow, it must be true because of that. And I think aspirin and nitric oxide are kind of on the same level of that amount of studies. But we can't just see, you know, just because there's a lot of studies, it's the truth. I mean, um, maybe with aspirin, there's something there, but probably not with nitric oxide. And it's like, we can't really go by that, right? <laughs> yeah, I, well, actually, if you go and look at the Cochrane, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Cochrane reports, which are, uh, ba they're basically a peer-reviewed uh, organization for doctors on the efficacy of studies. And literally, if you, I think about 95% of the studies that have looked at omega threes now, whether you're looking at depression, dementia, um, bowel inflammation, um, heart disease, li literally all of the applications in the meta analysis show no clear effect of, of increasing the, these type of fatty acids. And I think there is probably a couple of studies that show there's weak, uh, there's a weak association with benefits, but it's, there's no, nothing clear or substantial. And I think when you look over the kind of long-term studies, 
particularly with things whether it's like uh, the, the cardiac risk issues uh, that they become more problematic and that's why in obese and uh, and other kind of heart problem related issues you'll see an abundance of the of the the fatty acids like dha and the more stable ones which break down uh unstable ones which break down and i think that's unless you're looking at the long range order and the long range effects of these it's very easy to show in that cardiac risk narrative that yeah ldl's decreasing yeah triglycerides are decreasing yes glucose sensitivity and insulin sensitivity appear better regulated primarily just because you haven't you've been oxidizing more fatty acids so you are going to have a beneficial effect of what appears beneficial for uh, regulating glucose but the end end effect is that that quite harsh lipid peroxide lip, and lipid peroxidation that's going to cause all that damage over time so people aren't looking at that they're just looking at that short short range effect and it's a bit like saying well hey, hey if we give statins in this kind of high risk person they seem to have an effect and they are going to have an effect if someone who's in a immediate risk of having, you know, a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. But the long range effects and their effects on mitochondria, and there's dozens and dozens of studies now that are showing that statins actually uh, disrupt mitochondrial function over time. Much like um, I think that the synergy between and I think I wrote a blog a few months back. I can't remember because of what's going on these days. Uh, but saying that statins and, and, and fish oils like DHA had the same degenerative effect over time. Uh, I have a suggestion at the moment. I'm not sure how true this is, but tend to see in Alzheimer's, you tend to see depleted uh, DHA. But in Parkinson's, you see elevated. And I think the distinction in perhaps in Alzheimer's is that the reason why Parkinson's patients tend to have bat- better outcomes with higher lipids and higher cholesterol values um, is because that they're just it's just more protective but then with alzheimer's i think because they're looking at a slightly different lens where there are areas that have been depleted of dha because it's the most easily oxidized most easily taken out of the the the, the cell membrane as such it's probably used as a fuel first of all when when you have a a poor glucose um system or functioning system lack of aerobic metabolism loss of, of glucose signaling and, and, and function at large. So that's why I think there tends to be a misnomer between the neurological decline. But it's, it's still, it's, it, it, unless you're prepared to wade through all those studies, and there are plenty of meta-analysis that show that DHA and fish oil supplementation have no clear effect and certainly aren't protective. Wow. So um, I just want to get that straight. Alzheimer's is low DHA in the brain and Parkinson's is high DHA in the brain, or is it vice versa? <laughs> well no what what the, what they're saying and certainly there's a couple of big papers that have suggested that within parkinson's the progression is halted by having higher cholesterol values within the brain but that what's 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 not being looked at within alzheimer's there's just this this assumption that because dha is being depleted in various aspects of the brain i can't recall which of the specific areas of the neurological structures right now but um it shows that there's a depletion and i don't think this depletion is probably anything more than the ability of those fatty acids to be easily used as a fuel source and depleted quicker uh, and more readily from from any lipid membrane area um sorry excuse me and uh, i i think that's that's the problem and the assumption that people are saying oh well there's low dha levels well actually they're just being metabolized uh, over, over some of the other fatty acids that we're seeing uh, and but now the assumption is as though oh, there must be low dha this we must kind of increase the amount of fish oils to make somebody more neurologically robust but that that, that doesn't seem to be be the case uh, and then again there may be a short-term beneficial effect because all of a sudden there's a, a, an influx of fuel but that influx of fuel and that's why the brain doesn't tend to use much much fatty acids as a fuel particularly unsaturated fatty acids it has a higher um, cholesterol and higher saturated fatty acid content within the brain because the brain doesn't like breaking these down as a fuel it prefers glucose uh, and you have to be in a pretty bad way and i think that's why dementia and alzheimer's is called brain diabetes because it's just lost the ability to to use glucose and that and you and i both know but just because you've lost the ability to use glucose it's like saying sugar causes diabetes when clearly it doesn't yeah great point that's really interesting about the alzheimer's because i've been considering that over the last two or three years just thinking about that dha connection because i used to believe that that um you know what you were just describing i wonder if there's a lipoflescin aspect that 
a lot of the DHA, uh, the N minus three fatty acids are just going to complex with iron in the brain. And so, so there's just more lipofuscin and that's, what's actually depleting the DHA causing the Alzheimer's at the root. Uh, be yeah. Interesting. A, I, I think you could probably talk about lipofuscin more than I do because it's one of your, <laughs> one of your key areas of expertise in it. But I mean, certainly, uh, you know, if you're, if you're seeing any kind of lipofuscin externally, then you can assume that in, in neurological areas and other, and perhaps in or, organ tissue, you're going to see that, that damage occurring. Um, I did read somewhere recently that, that perhaps it has a, a slightly protective level. It kind of reminds me of, of uh, Albert St. George's, um, you know, plant damage uh, system where there's a certain discoloring that occurs, but at some point it becomes extremely problematic, but it's, it's probably an initial reaction that's quite protective. But you can probably tell me more about that than, than, than I know because it's not something I, I am, I'm, I'm that well versed on, but I know the accumulation of lipofuscin is particularly damaging and, and obviously uh, it, it has, a, it has an, a nasty end result when it accumulates too much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, I understand it just shuts down the lysosomal uh, digestion of junk, like oxidized proteins and, and lipids, and then it shuts down the proteasome, um, which is a big deal. But then it catalyzes the Fenton reaction, um, which turns hydrogen peroxide, a normal uh, byproduct of metabolism, into the hydroxyl radical which is not sure. good. <laughs> yeah, and that's where you need your, um, your, ex, your extra glutathione, right? Because that, 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 that peroxide will keep breaking down and <laughs> you have uh, depleted uh, glutathione over time. Uh, and again, this is another one, one of the things that you're going to tend to see in those uh, very sensitive neural structures that have a high energy demand. Uh, and when you keep breaking down fatty, fatty acids, particularly unsaturated fatty acids, the formation of lipofuscin and, and, and the reduction of glutathione is, is, is why we get well, it's a part. It's one of the the primary drivers of why you see neurological degeneration. I think that the carryover with thyroid physiology is, is really important there because, as I said, thyroid hormone. There are some papers that just suggest that actually thyroids are more potent antioxidant than vitamin E, uh, and when there's not an abundance within the cell and crossing over into the cell, whether that goes through one of the many transporters like the the the, the MCT, the monocarboxylate tr transporter. Uh, 10, which I think is more skeletal muscle, uh, and 8, which is in, within the brain. Uh, when, when, when you get a lot of, of thyroid hormone signaling, it can be catastrophic to, to the general oxidative state, the ability to uh, you know, maintain um, ongoing function when you have this high peroxide levels, reduced glutathione, uh, and uh, ultimately when, when it breaks down, you know, uh, perhaps uh, inhibition of pyruvate and and the uh, the production of lactate and, and ammonia after a while, and when you start to see this in the brain, loss of thyroid function, still there, there, there's there's a this uh, almost neglect that thyroid is is important for resolving dementia. But there are actually plenty of studies that show actually Parkinson's and thyroid do actually have a much better sorry Parkinson's and Alzheimer's do actually have a a much better outcome when you restore thyroid tissue, but Sometimes uh, you need to look at the diiodinase expression, so um, how how the whole you know T four to T three is converted, uh, and sometimes if you're looking at say just TSH and and you're, you've got an idea that there might be some issue going on, but most doctors aren't going to look at that until you're hitting four five MIULs. Uh, but I, I've like Ray Pete always said, I never saw anyone who was uh, particularly healthy with a TSH above two. Uh, and I'd still, you know, keeping it well below one and around about 0 0.5 is where I see some pretty good results with clients. But a lot of people jumping up in the air going, oh, they're going to go hyper. But, you know, looking at heart rate, body temperature uh, and other useful indicators can, can usually avoid that. Um, I, I'll share with you, I had a client once that, that just didn't listen to me on dosing. And instead of starting off at half a grain, uh, actually took 10 grains a day for a week um, because she was relatively young and healthy. Um, you know, she's like in her 30s. I said, look, OK, you need to stop now. Your heart rate's going to go up pretty soon. Uh, and lo and behold, the next day it shot up to 150 beats per minute resting pulse. And I said, all you need to do is stop, eat throughout the day. If you really want to chow down on a couple of uh, servings of broccoli, feel free, go to. Literally, lo and behold, the next day, heart rate was down to 110, down to 190, and then very normal again. So the absolute risk from uh, thyroid hormone is actually 
it's quite low unless somebody's in an immediate risk of having uh, a heart attack, uh, which is usually quite obvious in some people. Uh, then you could also uh, be quite prudent and say, well, how do you know in some cases? And uh, well, that, how do you know sometimes when someone's going to go for a run and have a heart attack? There are usually some indicators like coronary artery calcium score that might give an indicator. But somebody could be subclinically hypothyroid for so many years before they get to that state. Um, or, you know, equally, you get the young people who, who drop dead on a run. They may, may have inherited uh, low thyroid traits, which is easily done. And there's plenty of studies that show that hypothyroid parents pass on these hypothyroid traits to their kids. And if they're subclinically hypo long enough without being picked up, you push someone on a, on a pretty heavy exercise session or trying to run a marathon for the first time, then there, there are risks involved with that. But usually, you know, starting off with a very low dose of thyroid can usually ameliorate any, any risk. Uh, so I, I think the, the risks are often outstated. And uh, like many things, uh, an environment of fear is created around its use. And I, I think that might be something to do with protecting blood uh, insulin measurement uh, sales, cholesterol sales. Um, hypertensive medication, beta blockers, and the other one, they're worth tens of billions of dollars a year. And I think making someone high, uh, youth thyroid is probably w one of the easiest and cost efficient uh, mechanisms that will take a lot of burden off the healthcare system, but probably dent the profits at the same time. But that would be being a cynic, of course. Have you ever used a desiccated thyroid uh, instead of um, like armor or cytomel or any of that? Like, do, do, do you think it's a little weaker? Because that's kind of my understanding. <laughs> what, well, NDT? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I, I've, I've yeah. generally actually done quite well on NDT personally. I, my thyroid issue started about five or six years ago. I had six mercury teeth drilled out all at once. And within two or three months, I gained 10 kilos, was cold in bed, didn't want to go to work. Uh, and it took me a while to, to, to understand what was going on. Um, well, not a while, it just... Uh, I, I, it took me a while to get my act together. Actually, no, it, it was seven or eight years ago. Uh, and it's kind of the, one of the reasons that pushed me more towards uh, Ray's work. Uh, and I've always done really quite well on NDT. I have uh, experimented with Sinomel and Sinoplast, and I've, I've, I've felt pretty good on that personally. Uh, a lot of my clients tend to do well on, on any mixture. They could do well on, you know, uh, LT4. They could do well on NDT. They could do well on... T3, some have even done really quite well on glandulars. So I think it's really a personal preference out of, out of all of them. Um, I don't think there's anything set in stone there. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, let's jump into the Q&A because there's quite a few questions and uh, I'm sure we'll have a little offshoot so we can kind of discuss different things if I have a question that pops up. Um, someone asks, any tips for type 1 diabetes? Um, well, it, it depends where, where it's come from. I mean, obviously there are many reasons why... Um, type 1 diabetes can start. It could be a viral expression, perhaps. It could be certain damage that induces damage to the pancreas. There can be a key link to low thyroid function. Um, it depends on how, how long that damage has been occurring. I think that the most useful consideration for when it comes to thyroid and, and type 1 is when people are around the point of being diagnosed as type 1, I think there's a real need to explore that what 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 uh, thyroid hormone can do from a supportive aspect. Uh, again, if we look at inheritance again, it's quite easy for hypothyroid parents to pass on uh, poorly formed pancreatic function uh, within a subclinical hypothyroid state that's not picked up. So without an actually answering the question yet, my, my thoughts would be to experiment to see what can be done with thyroid hormone. Uh, I don't think there's anything set in stone that the, the pancreas will all magically regenerate, but I think it's always worth a try of experimenting with that and see what happens to insulin responses um, and, and blood sugar responses as part of that. But sometimes the, perhaps damage is, is too far gone, depending on if they've been from birth. But I, I think there's always potential. How much potential is, is possible by sorting your food out, understanding the environment around you, understanding how, um, you know, there are some studies in, in rodents, albeit, that have shown that they've induced type 1 di diabetes and that has been um, uh, restored back to normal pancreatic function by, by uh, utilizing thyroid hormone. Uh, and so there, there, are, there is capacity within rodents and just like 
they're able to regrow liver back um, and various other bits of tissue. There's always some hope in there, but it's really going to depend on the person, their diet, their environment, how they get on with thyroid hormone, uh, and ultimately what the, the what happens to insulin and blood sugar levels as 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 they experiment with that. Awesome. Yeah, all right. Um, this is a good segue. I'm on levothyroxine for hypo. Can I stop cold turkey and heal with diet? That's is that T4? Yeah, yeah, LT4. Um, I always kind of, you know, I come from a background. I used to be a holistic lifestyle coach uh, and, and rehab uh, a personal trainer. So I spent a lot of time thinking that going, you know, low carb diets were really healthy. Eating milk was bad. It, milk, cheese, dairy, sugar was bad. And, and also, I also had the narrative that I didn't want clients or myself to be on any medication because that's unnatural. Uh, my own kind of thought process now is that actually taking thyroid hormone to support the thyroid to get back to where it could be can be considered one of the most holistic things that an individual can do, primarily because you're restoring every single aspect of function. Now, I would never say to anyone, look, if you've been taking thyroxine, uh, first of all, is it working for you? Have you got great temps, you know, 36 and a half degrees on waking, go to 37, which I think is about 97.8 to 98.6 Fahrenheit. With good temperatures, depending on who you look at, it could be 70 to 85, 75 to 90, depending on, on, on how you look at it. So if that's working for you and you have a great libido, good um, digestion, mood, sleep, absence of pain, you're balanced, you kind of have a, a relative amount of get up and go and dealing with solutions and problems, that's a good sign something's working for you. Can you come off thyroid hormone? Yes, you can. Do you want to do it cold turkey? Probably not a good idea. I think uh, gradually going down a dose, depending on what someone's on. Typically, most people are on a kind of like a, you know, about 100 to 150 milligrams of T4. Perhaps if you're not there looking at a dose of T4 to T3 combos or even, as I said earlier on, you might do better on NDT. You might do, do better on a T3 alone. You might do better on a glandular, which I've seen as well with some people. So it's, it's really a, a preference. But whether someone's working for you, I think, you know, digestion, sleep, absence of pain, um, libido, mood are a, a key, you know, factors on whether it's working for you and, and whether you want to attempt to come off that. And if it doesn't, if your temperature gets worse, you start getting slower motility in the bowel, constipation, mood, blood glucose irregularities, not be able to kind of go long periods of the day um, uh, without kind of something happening, then it's probably not not a good sign, and you may want to to revisit why that's not working. That's 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 a really interesting philosophy um, about uh, supplementing thyroid being the most natural thing. Because I hear uh, people in the community saying like, you want to take less supplements if you're reliant on it, then it means that you don't have a foundation down. Um, there's a lot of different perspectives on it. That's interesting. Um, I have heard, I think Ray talk about the safety of thyroid, like they've megadosed, is it rats on thyroid hormone and shut down their thyroid. And then just within a few days, it came back to normal. <laughs> yeah. And, but I, it seems, I think it sounds you, pretty safe. <laughs> I, I, like I said, I use that, that story of, uh, of, uh, the, the client t- took 10 grains a day and it was totally manageable. Um, I, I think, you know, it's a bit like the, the concept of the paleo diet. Uh, and perhaps what was right for us 10, 20,000 years ago. And to a degree, we still can't say, uh, well, we know what the paleo diet's about anyway, so we wouldn't use that as a a great example. But trying to consider that uh, we're in the same environment then that we are now. I I live in a very polluted area of the world, um, and I get clients to me that are kind of uh, brushed off by people because they've had their natural thyroid tests. Uh, And I think, and partly why I want to do this as part of a study is to check the difference between applying T4 to someone, to T4 and T3. So, you know, Ray's always talked about becoming more within the environment, and I think that's important. If you have an environment that's really harsh, it's shouting at you, it's dictating how you're responding, you need to have a better conversation with the environment. And that's why looking at kind of not just T4, but understanding the difference between what T4 and T3, can, the effect it can have, to see if you can overcome pollutants and and really that's what my next port of research is going to be looking at is is understanding that and i I could be quite wrong is to say that when you you apply pollution and you apply t4 there's not the same response as t4 and t3 so what i want to see and what kind of 
back up what I'm suggesting is that perhaps taking thyroid hormone can give someone enough to become more within any given environment. And when you live in a very polluted environment, I think that's something that needs to be considered. I think if you've inherited hypothyroid traits, if you had a, a blissful growing up, you live rurally, you've had everything emotionally uh, that you need and, and there's been a lack of stress, there's no reason why you can't outgrow those hypothyroid traits. You have plenty of fruit, plenty of sunshine, good sleep, nurturing parents. There's no, nothing wrong uh, uh, with, with suggesting that you, you probably won't need it. But to the extent that the environment's breaking someone down, it's quite stressful. They're in an emotional relationship that causes stress. They're, you know, stress at work. Um, obviously, nutrition is, 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 is the foundation for anything. But I think you have to take it on a case-by-case -case scenario. And that's why I think restoring thyroid function is, is one of the most holistic things that can happen. Some people can do it, you know, by addressing nutrition and being longer with it. Some people definitely need that that nudge in the right direction. That that makes sense. It's, it's really interesting. Um, someone asked how to increase body temperature and should the temperature be the same throughout the day? Okay, so I, I think uh, um, it's useful con to consider those kind of variables that I mentioned earlier on. Um, I think as, as the day goes down and we head towards darkness, you know, body temperatures kind of drop a little bit. So I think certainly sticking anywhere between that 36 and a half and 37 degrees. And certainly as it progresses through nighttime, it's going to drop anyway. Melatonin you know, production will kind of make the body colder to a degree. Uh, as we kind of deplete glucose, we're going to, depending on the person and how, how, how strong the stress response is, it's going to have a, an effect on temperature, might go up, might go down, depending on what's going on with the person. Um, I like to use, um, when I'm starting out with clients, um, you can often see quite a normal um, oral temperature. And something I, I've looked at quite a lot with clients is I think there can, the, the bigger difference that you see between the oral and the armpit temperature is usually an indicator that there's something going on. So I think the armpit personally, I've looked at some papers that suggest that the, um, the core temperature or the central compartment theory, which comprises the head and the core, should be exactly the same. And then peripherally, hands, feet might cool down. So I think the armpit should be the same as the mouth. And to the extent that there's a larger discrepancy, I think you'll tend to see that correlate with, oh, my digestion's not great, my sleep not great, my libido's a bit low, my menstrual cycle's all over the shop, um, uh, mood is issue. And, and generally when you see a, a bigger temperature than 0 0.5 degree in the armpit, so typically I might see someone that's 36 and a half in the mouth, doesn't change much and they're kind of 35 and a half in the armpit and sometimes into 34s uh, and, and that's a good diagnostic for suggesting that some, th something's not quite right but then generally when you get the nutrition right that armpit value tends to mirror and increase and then increases and mirrors the, the oral temperature but I think having that within half a degree is useful it gets a bit of a pain in the ass doing both and you need to do the armpit for longer but when starting out it's useful just to consider that but to answer the, the question exactly is, yeah, we'll have a few changes throughout the day. But I think sticking within the 36 and a half to 37 and, and maintain it close to that is a good sign that things are working. There'll be environmental issues like temperature changes that might be a factor and, and may take that slightly uh, uh, out of that. That's awesome. And for people in the States, that's uh, 97.7 uh, <laughs> Fahrenheit to 98.6 <laughs> yeah, different sorry. measurements. Stand, stand <laughs> <Sorry. of Brit. laughs> it's easier. It's a better system, I think. But um, this is an interesting one. What does it mean when you get brain fog triggered by coffee, even after meals? Um, I guess it's someone's husband. He's a male, high prolactin, low temp, and he's putting uh, cream and maple syrup in the coffee, but it makes him sleepy. Well, that's an interesting one. It can be, can be many things. I mean, sometimes uh, I'm sometimes the I've, you could even start off with something as simple as the fillers in cream. Sometimes uh, check that there's no kind of. I, I see lots of uh, American clients that have things like soy oil added to the cream, or you know, over here they get with plenty of carrageenan. So first of all, check it's not an additive. Uh, sometimes because uh, caffeine is essentially stimulating aerobic respiration. Uh, there can be a deficit in a B vitamin loss, sometimes B1 or B2 that needs uh, supporting. 
Um, if he's got high prolactin, th- there can be some issues with low thyroid, higher estrogen exposure from an environmental estrogen, perhaps. Um, depending on what he's eating, it, it, you need to look at perhaps some of the foods uh, in between that. But if it's high prolactin, there might there might be something environmentally that that's driving that. You know, even even water source can be an issue sometimes for some people. Um, if you're taking because standard water supplies that's got fluoride in it or something can have a negative effect the thyroid hormone conversion so it can be literally 10 to 15 different things to work through but uh you know caffeine should have a a beneficial effect sometimes you can have too much caffeine as well and can have that effect on brain fog um it could be could be a number of things but the interesting the prolactin would be looking at and seeing if uh, thyroid's uh, functioning appropriately not too much estrogen um yeah, that would be a good start. Temperatures with that would be interesting. To yeah, see that, temperatures. That was... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I would agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, those are great points. And I was just going to say with the water too, I think people often overlook like um, iron and excess calcium in the water. That tends to be high in like spring water. Um, I'm a fan of filtering it somewhat, even if it's just very basic reverse osmosis. But I notice a lot of people like where I'm at drinking just straight well water and like, uh, there's a lot of stuff in that water. Like if you throw, run it through even a sediment filter, it turns brown. It's like, that's a ton yeah. of iron going into the system. <laughs> oh yeah. And I think it's a problem uh, in, in a lot of places over here. The water's a real problem because uh, a lot of it comes out of, uh, it's desalinated by the aluminium plant. Um, so I actually oh, get wow. my water from the coffee roasters because they've got a quarter of a million pound filtration system that takes everything out and they go through filters once a week and they remineralize it. And it's literally the best, it's low acidity, acidity content. I think when, one of the issues with uh, water here is it's uh, because it's been desalinated, it's high in chloride because the sodium has been removed and it can cause all sorts of issues. But the coffee roasters were so concerned that it was affecting their machines and the taste of their coffee. They spent so much money on this filtration system so I think water is, 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 a, is, a, is a big challenge wherever you are. Um, you know, so I think a, a good filtration system can be quite helpful. Um, I mean, it can be a, a small factor for some people, but it can, be, it can be one of those things that tips people over the edge if there's a high load from high pollution area, high stress, you know, perhaps plenty of foods that uh, have plenty of additives in. Might, you know, it's worth ticking all the boxes to see why that might go. Yeah, yeah. Um... Someone asks, is it possible that I will feel super crappy when I've lowered my stress hormones? Yeah. So, I mean, this is typically when you see you'll get someone that looks like they've actually got normal temperatures and pulse, uh, and but they're kind of eating every six or seven hours or they're skipping breakfast. They're under a lot of stress. They're exercising fasted. So as soon as you take that load off, uh, you, you're basically reducing the amount of adrenaline, cortisol, glucagon that's being produced and that can have a nice kind of relaxing effect. Uh, and to, to the extent that appears relaxing, uh, it depends on how someone's thyroid is functioning. Now, if your thyroid is, is being suppressed by these high stress hormones, then it's perfectly normal to feel absolutely crap when you just basically just sit down and the body goes, see, that's where I'm at now. Uh, and, it, it, and it's a useful thing for someone to go to because there's so some people are habitually kind of used to uh, running off the stress hormones. I think it was Gabe Amate quote, he said that some people are are so used to running off of stress hormones, adrenaline and that, that actually slowing down and feeling relaxed is so alien to them, they don't know how to do it. Uh, But yeah, it's perfectly normal to feel worse, slower, more lethargic, more brain fog, sometimes worse sleep, um, sometimes rattier. Uh, All of these things um, can can be expressed when when you slow the body down. That's awesome. Um, Thoughts on how to trick fix adrenal insufficiency is coffee and dairy okay yeah i think it is um i think obviously to the extent that that all caffeine consumption has a context in the things we kind of talked about is like you know never have first thing in the morning always have after food if you're going to have it in the day uh, have it as a snack with kind of some perhaps some milk cream or sugar but i i i've actually found some some adrenal issues with um with a couple of clients and myself once uh, I had a, a, a chest infection and every time I took thyroid hormone I got absolutely I felt terrible I actually just found supplementing with progesterone was enough 
to uh, to be used to support the adrenals because obviously progesterone will, will convert to cortisol. And I thought, found that had a really beneficial effect. And as soon as I started taking thyroid with progesterone, and I've seen this in, with a couple of other clients as well, is that adrenals can be supported. Now, obviously, when you have true uh, hypoadrenalism, usually supplemental synthetic cortisol is used anyway. And that can be quite problematic for, for, for many reasons, for um, getting the dose right for thyroid hormone, the effects of synthetic cortis, uh, glucocorticoids can be quite problematic. So it's, it's really useful to, to, to understand whether you actually have hypoadrenalism. I don't like to use the term adrenal fatigue because the adrenals, are, obviously adrenal function is supported by thyroid physiology. But there can be a clear case that of a need for supplemental cortisol sometimes. And I have found that even in guys, supplemental progesterone can offset that substantially. That's really interesting because I've heard it said that that progesterone converting to cortisol is a bad thing. But is it because it takes the burden off of the adrenals to make cortisol? Um, yeah. Is that like the benefit? Yeah. I mean, progesterone is easily converted to, to obviously corti uh, corticosteroids. Um, and I think you could even argue to a degree that having supplemental pregnenolone might help as well. But I found that personally, I found that uh, progesterone had tend to be much more readily available and seemed to do the trick much, much more efficiently. But that the argument would be, you know, having enough vitamin A available, B vitamins, adequate uh, cholesterol conversion and adequate pregnenolone would be the base for that. But I, I, I my my tendency is to suggest to use progesterone to deal with that. That's that's interesting. Um, how to lower, how to truly lower uh, A1C, that hemoglobin A1C. Yeah, so that's that's obviously the typical blood test that's used. It's glycated uh, hemoglobin. So I I think actually eating enough carbohydrates is a good start. I've seen uh, several uh, clients with HbO A1C levels told they're pre-diabetic that it's totally normalized. In some clients, it's been eating adequate carbohydrates, certainly lowering the amount of unsaturated fatty acids uh, as well and, and, and not relying on, you know, uh, uh, fatty acid generally as a rule because the, the, the general uh, dietary guidelines is to go low carb because carbs must be the problem because the glu high glucose is the issue. Um, so, you know, you could uh, certainly find quite a few papers that when you restore someone's thyroid physiology, uh, uh, HbA1c tests tend to return to normal. I think it's above 6.6 .6 that's uh, suggestive of being diabetic. And then the kind of anywhere from the 5.5s upwards is the kind of pre-diabetic state. But even that's not a great test and indicator that, that, uh, of, uh, of glucose function. But equally, you could argue, argue that maintaining adequate carbohydrates, not dipping into the stress response, uh, maintaining thyroid status is is particularly useful. You know, one of the key problems with going for an HbA1c test, there are many people just because they have hyperglycemia, high high glucose levels, and poor insulin responses, that it's it's automatically presumed that sugar's the problem. But there are so many uh, papers and and just basic biological textbooks that show that when you uh, make someone even subclinically hypothyroid. Uh, that a hyperglycemia is present and insulin response is blunted. Um, and so restoring thyroid physiology would be my kind of go-to to start with. And that's always on a, on a decent base of nutrition. You can't discount the effects of adequate light as well, restoration of uh, metabolic processes, maintenance of the uh, aerobic transport, the electron transport chain is always key, uh, and ability to utilize glucose full stop. That's awesome. Um... Can he elaborate on fish oil making chemotherapy more effective? Uh, I think you, you sure. alluded to this a little earlier, but <laughs> yeah. So th there's there's an uh, abundance. Of, I say abundance. There's certainly emerging research where DHA is being used to enhance cytotoxicity of chemotherapy, uh, and I think it's all being packaged in this really neat, attractive uh, box that says, "Hey, fish oils not only do all these things like lower triglycerides and LDLs." they actually make chemotherapy work much more efficiently. And I think that, that what's lost in that is the, the damage and the effect on cells. So DHA induced something called pyroptosis, which everyone understand, uh, has a rough idea of what apoptosis is. It's nice kind of programmed cell death. Well, pyroptosis is, is, is more, more uh, to do with the, the inflammasome and the inflammatory response. 
Um, wh one of the things that DHA tends to do is poke holes in the cell membrane. Uh, part of the aspect of that is when the oxidized head gets uh, oxidized, it flips in the cell membrane called the flip-flop effect. So what you have is this kind of leakiness. Um, so it, it, the concept of cell permeability is kind of, is also wrapped up in that. So when you get oxidation, perhaps because of all the, the metabolic, um, the high rate of metabolism that's going on there, and you get oxidized uh, lipids, particularly the DHA, sorry, not the lipids, uh, the unsaturated fatty acids like DHA, as soon as they oxidize, they are going to flip at the cell membrane. They are going to make the membrane more leakier and they have kind of bigger holes that I think disorder the water structure in there as well. So what chemotherapy is, is, is being perhaps utilized with DHA is because DHA is going in and making the, the outer structure or the membrane much more leakier and therefore the, uh, the damaging toxicological effects of chemotherapy can actually leak into the cell and make it uh, more damaged and work its effect. One of the studies that I looked at a few months back was suggesting that actually DHA doesn't seem to have the same effect to the surrounding cells therefore it's probably protective. Now I think you can look at that in two ways and the problem is that is if you have normal cells around tumor and remember the tumor microenvironment tends to be quite problematic and can be quite acidic uh, it can have ongoing um, many issues like uh, degrading telomeres uh, you know increasing the amount of uh, fatty acids that are being oxidized that this kind of constant degradation of fatty acids as a fuel now I think what you're looking at is probably the cells around it are slightly more healthier than, than the tumor cells. So it would probably take a higher dose of DHA to make them more unstable. But yet the, the, the cancer cell is, is unstable to, to a degree that DHA can probably go in and, and damage it further. And therefore, these kind of enhanced effects of, of chemotherapy are cited. But it doesn't necessarily mean that DHA is is safe, it just enhances this kind of cellular toxicity and allows uh, chemotherapy to do its job. Wow, Had, have you looked into like uh, the CERT1 gene uh, increasing yeah, tumor? a little bit. Tumor uh, growth, yeah. <laughs> nice and resveratrol are like pushed right now in the supplement world. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I haven't looked at it a lot. I think isn't CERT1 is supposed to be the gene that's upregulated during fasting and calorific restriction? Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, ergo, it's, ergo, it's protective because it slows down metabolism and the less amount of oxidative stress that's produced must enhance biology because, uh, because that's how we slow down aging, which is kind of slightly mental to me still. So I, I haven't looked at it from that perspective, but I'm assuming DHA enhances CERT1 expression, does it? I, I think so. Yeah, I... Um... I just got this chart on my wall, the systems biology of human aging. It's pretty cool. And it breaks down basically the cause of every disease with like lines on it <clears throat> made by a guy, John Ferber. Um, but it, it's funny because there will be little supplements in there like that. This helps this gene like resveratrol or niacin. And I'm like, no, just switch that out for niacinamide, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I need to look. I, one thing I have to get my head into uh, that my potential professor has told me I have to have a look at more uh, the genomic effects of thyroid hormone physiology. Uh, and rem remember, most of the beneficial effects, is, it's a bit like, um, you know, the stress response when you, when you approach 35 degrees and are reaching a hypothermic value, the body perceives this as a stress because you start to inhibit many, many enzymes. So the body doesn't want you to get cold. So as part of the cold and thermogenic re re warming response, we start to liberate energy from brown adipose tissue. But to the extent that that's effective, it's thyroid hormone dependent. So the, 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 it, the way that it actually becomes beneficial is to the extent that you can express it efficiently. But getting back to the argument with kind of fasting is like there's a, an interplay between thyroid hormone and CERT1 as well. But obviously, to the extent that you chronically fast, you see some naturopaths doing water fasts for how many hours, like 24 hours or 36 hour water fasts. And these are young people usually most of the time that are doing that. And when you're younger, you have much more flexibility. So I, I used to be able, able to go out and play football on a Saturday and then go to the Ministry of Sound Clubbing all night and then turn up for Sunday league football. But if I was doing it now, I'd probably die. So it's, it's, it's understanding what, what your body can get away with to a degree. 
And I think looking at the, the expressions of thyroid hormone and what happens to them from a, a restriction perspective and when cert ones increased. But again, it tends to be this binary kind of uh, attitude that, hey, well, you know, fast increases cert one, ergo it must be protective. Um, but actually, there's some interesting studies in, in centenarians that show that uh, centenarians with uh, higher thyroid hormone expressions are much more agile, generally doing a bit more, not as decrepit. Uh, and I think hopefully now we're going to start to see more research like that that suggests, well, actually, um, the muddying of the waters that suggests, you know, increased uh, TSH values in the aging population is is a normal thing. But I think that that um, that they're still kind of not getting where the expression is and what's protective and what's not. And what are we seeing in these super centenarians where it looks like increased thyroid hormone is uh, is a key player in promoting longevity that's probably not going to be um, maintained when you're going through this uh, new kind of approach of fasting and, and increasing the amount of fish fish uh, oils in your diet. Um, I, you know, well, I think we're at a crossing. We're at an interesting point because I think although there's been kind of extreme variations of diet and lifestyle and exercise regimes, I think in the last 20 years, there's been some real extreme versions coming out uh, that people are kind of sticking to. And I, you know, looking at the old data of kind of people dying at their 110s, 115s and 120s, you look at Jean Clement, the lady who'd lived to 123, 124, I think, she was eating two, a kilo of chocolate a week. So I don't think these a lot of these kind of older people have been uh, in a, in a life of restriction and um, you know suppression of biology, it's probably been been, been a little bit of everything. Staying quite happy, keeping their biology maintained, and 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 uh, also feeding it rather than restricting it. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up centenarians and longevity in general because that's um, a big reason why I got into health. It's just a fascination of mine, like extreme longevity and. Uh, I always get questions about the blue zones, like Matt, what about the blue zones? And, you know, what about the, the Japanese that have a seafood diet or <clears throat> all these questions kind of go together. Um, but I think there's so many factors, so many variables that, I mean, the water, the stress level, the air, there's mm -hmm. so many things going on there that it's hard to say. I, I mean, I bet diet is really a small, uh, part of it. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Li Ching, when too he was a chinese herbalist that lived uh, 256 years old uh which sounds impossible but uh a lot of these really? <clears throat> were documented like way up well beyond 200 <laughs> it, uh, yeah it's it's really hard i mean you uh, you talk about the example of the blue zones i mean even they're pretty inaccurate and they reckon a lot of the jap like say japanese areas for example where you have these super centenarians that actually quite a few of them were dead and it was their family still uh, claiming their pension. And there's quite a, been a, quite a few documentations of that, that actually they've been dead for 20 or 30 years, uh, but they haven't been recorded or kind of struck off the list yet. And I think the, the concept of blue zones is quite problematic. Um, you know, I think I, I'm not sure that the oldest, the, the, the only oldest one I can think of in recent times is that Jean Clement who died in, you know, 120s, but you know, going back and saying that they kind of died in, at 200, 250s. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's really hard to to, to clarify that from a, a data perspective, isn't it? As much as we, we live in hope. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's really interesting, though. I'd like to see what's, what's possible. Um, so this is a really good question. Uh, how does ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate deplete copper and calcify arteries um i i i i'm probably not the best person to answer that you might be able to, better able to answer that uh, uh, with than me i but I are, are you of... talking about the synthetic ascorbate <laughs> yeah i believe they're talking about supplementing uh ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate and i think because it cop copper is a complex or um, mm -hmm. vitamin c is a complex and so when they take you know just aa uh, it's my understanding that it has to you know it's it's incomplete and so it'll actually grab copper uh from the body but i don't know about the calcify arteries well, thing, i guess way downstream well there's a couple of things to consider with that i guess is that uh because if you take high levels of uh, uh, that it can actually have a pro-oxidant effect uh and it'll probably deplete calcium uh, sorry uh copper at cytochrome c and so you may have inhibition of the mm. electron transport chain 
uh, especially when it has that pro oxidant effect. That would be my understanding. The other effect as well, I don't know, but from one thing I was reading uh, recently, I'm trying to just uh, put a seminar together on um, coronary artery calcium scores. And one thing I didn't realize is that this is slightly uh, tangent because perhaps we've explained that why that might happen, is that the TSH receptor uh, can actually be responsible for calcifying arteries um, because TH, the TSH receptor has a it's uh, found in bone tissue and uh, osteoblasts and is responsible for building bone. Um, there's a suggestion that the TSH receptor located in the endothelium, and i.e. I, the, um, the uh, tissue for uh, the arterial wall, can, when thyroid uh, stimulating hormone is being expressed at a higher rate, now bearing in mind, if, if I tend to think of any time we're using the, the pituitary hormones, they're generally a stress response because normal autonomous conversion peripherally has been lost or perhaps there's other things going on, particularly you know, if you look at ovarian steroids and the need for producing FSH or luteinizing hormone. So, But if you think about um, the, the role of TSH, if it has the ability to build bone, there's potentially the suggestion that the TSH receptor being expressed within the, uh, the vascular or the arterial wall can lead to coronary artery calcification. So um, that's a slight tangent, but I, I, I found that quite interesting when it comes to calcification of, of, of soft tissues related to uh, cardiovascular system. Uh, and even, you, you know, you could tie in with that when you do have a, a loss of uh, aerobic physiology, which can happen with uh, lack of thyroid hormone. Even if you're kind of expressing, you know, above 0 0.5, perhaps even one, one and a half, and certainly up to two, you are going to be having uh, the increased effects of TSH. And we know TSH as a hormone is a stress hormone, increases fibrosis and could potentially increase calcification uh, and lend itself to kind of uh, hyperplasia of the, the thyroid gland itself. Wow. Wow, that's fascinating. And it's crazy that, that uh, there's so much misinformation about the TSH uh, test. <laughs> yeah, really I, 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 I'm actually... I, I'm not I don't put myself down as being a clever man by any any means it takes me four or five times to read something to get it I'm not uh I'm not uh, I wouldn't put myself down as being a particularly bright person but going to medical school and and I'm looking at a binary test that says thyroid stimulating hormone is the gold standard and it gives us a great example of when thyroid hormone is not working yet still there's uh you know plenty of literature on um Lack of thyroid hormone responsiveness. Uh, we see the re issues with the receptor, and just imagine that from a from an environmental perspective, there are plenty of hormones that hijack the estrogen receptor and the thyroid receptor. So if they've been hijacked and stimulated, the potential for thyroid circulating T4 and converting to T3, it's a bit like I, I use the analogy of driving around a, a parking lot trying to find a parking space. All the cars are filled up. So you just keep driving around and around. And within the context of your negative feedback loops, if you have enough T4 and T3 in your system circulating in the blood, the, the hypothalamus and pituitary doesn't need to function within that backup or stress response. So, you know, the, there is more literature coming out about, um, you know, the, the lack of function within the receptors. But still, the majority of physicians use the dogmatic belief that TSH is the gold standard for analyzing a thyroid. And when it comes back at two, three, and often even, I think people are starting to cotton on that four is not a good place to be, um, is that they'll, they'll look at that. But like, even if you, like places like Australia at the moment, the TSH of four is still considered perfectly normal. And physicians will refuse to look at total T3 or, total, or, or free T3 as a marker or any of the other thyroid hormones. And this is where you have an abundance of people that have constipation issues, energy, hair loss, fertility, menstrual cycle, libido, depression, certainly subclinical states going into winter when it gets darker, lack of sunlight. Even females that go through a menstrual cycle produce an abundance of estrogen can become subclinically hypothyroid during the follicular phase. And I've seen this with several female clients. So the, there is an interplay between thyroid hormones. There is a suppressive effect from not eating if it, uh, enough food, the production of the uh, cortisol, for example, 
Uh, and even, you know, the stress pathway with ACTH, uh, high levels of serotonin that can stimulate the, the adrenal gland directly at the gland with the, uh, without even stimulating the pituitary. Uh, the, the, this tends to get lost in translation. And this is why we get so many people, as I said at the beginning, with high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high glucose values. Uh, and then even when you've looked at applying a synthetic T4, you need to be looking at what the person's eating, what environment they're in. Many different things to see whether that's going to be effective or not as resolving that. And obviously, if you're eating a, uh, a diet and not eating enough, or eating high unsaturated fatty acids, which have a suppressive effect on thyroid physiology through th thyroid receptor expression, binding to these uh, thyroid carrier proteins, then it just goes out the window. Interesting. Um, someone asked, love to learn more about cholesterol and its effect on male hormones and the immune system. Um, I get a lot of questions of people with high cholesterol. Is that an inability to make thyroid hormone because it's used in that process, right? Yeah, so typically the, 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 the classic symptom of hypercholesterolemia, depending on the value, the LDL receptor, just like the thyroid receptor, is significantly reduced in hypothyroidism. The, therefore, the clearance, and I think something called mono cholesterol oxygenase, uh, I think that's right, is a, a reductive uh, enzyme for breaking down cholesterol. So you get basically reduced receptor expression, reduced enzyme expression, and therefore the cholesterol just ends up circulating, just like the, the uh, parking lot analogy. It doesn't have any place to bind to to get reduced to. Um, then the, the liver gets perhaps uh, sluggish, not producing as many enzymes or certain an abundance of other enzymes. Um, you may see increases in, in like uh, enzymes like uh, LDH, uh, the uh, lactic acid uh, enzyme. So you you know you can you can argue that high high hypothyroidism is a key driver of the uh, hypercholesterolemic state or high cholesterol. Now, to the extent that how you view cholesterol, uh, I always use, like to use May One Ho's quote: "How you look determines what you see." Um, if you're looking at just through the lens of a cardiac disease and you're still looking at that faulty narrative that you're looking at an artery that's been blocked by this massive cholesterol without looking at the calcium deposits, the unsaturated fatty acid deposits and other tissues that are there, and you just look at it from a heart disease perspective, then you're always going to come to the conclusion that high cholesterol is not good for the arteries. If you look at it from a low thyroid perspective, and certainly the data is there that shows that coronary artery calcification is a clear indicator of subclinical hypothyroidism. Unless you're looking at that and just assuming that cholesterol is going there, cholesterol might be in abundance there because it is an antioxidant. It is there as a building block for creating more tissue. It might be particularly abundant there because it's trying to restore what's going on. But unfortunately, the ability to utilize cholesterol is significantly diminished from a structural perspective and from uh, an excess perspective. Um, so perhaps, you know, uh, looking at uh, cholesterol as being protective and associated with longevity. And there's an interesting uh, meta-analysis that came out of Korea last year that looked at 13 million people. Uh, and it suggested actually lower cholesterol is associated with all-cause mortality and having a cholesterol level between 210 and 250 uh, nanograms per deciliter or 5.5 to 6.4 millimoles if you're in, in, in my neck of the woods is actually protective. And you see a, an abundance of people being put on statins when they're hitting that 5.5 without even looking at uh, what's going on from a thyroid perspective or looking at that TSH and coming up with a faulty narrative that actually the, the thyroid doesn't even need looking at because the TSH is completely normal. Wow. <laughs> That's wild. Um, oh, methylene blue had a question on that. Uh, prolonged use, mm. can that cause withdrawal symptoms? <laughs> um, I, I think methylene blue is, is, is a wonderful dye. Uh, and I think it, can, it shows promise in many different areas. I've certainly used it in Parkinson's clients and seen some very interesting results with it. Uh, I've seen it, um, you know, I've recommended it for many different things. I think it's useful as a, uh, an irregular supplement. Um, I, I think anything where there's an abundance of anything synthetic in the body can have an effect that uh, could be problematic. Um, its beneficial effects are kind of, uh, you know, reducing the effects of nitric oxide and guanine, 
guanidine cyclase, I think, is the other thing. So it's particularly useful for restoring uh, blood pressure responses. It's particularly useful for uh, decreasing the negative effects of sepsis. It has a, a beneficial effect on parasites. I'm not too sure. I, I know we're going uh, tangent slightly. I kind of think the uh, beneficial effects of uh, methylene blue is, as a um, anti-parasite are more when it's intravenously used rather than um, when it's taken orally. People, I think some people have this negative connota this connotation that it's uh, you take methylene blue, it's going to clear out all the parasites in your bowel when actually all they're going to do is stain them. And that's what's what it's been used for in some studies is to stain the parasites so they can be seen on on uh, under a microscope. So I think it is pretty useful. It is pretty good at um, um, restoring the electron transport chain. It uh, uh, donates electrons and accepts, uh, I think it's um, uh, donates, at, no, accepts at one and two and then donates at the end um, for the production of ATP. So it, it does some wonderful things and I think irregularly is useful. I wouldn't take every day. I might consider taking once every week or every couple of weeks or once a month depending on who I'm working with but it's a, a short-term thing to restore function um, and uh, my, my advice would be not to use it chronically. Awesome. Um, thoughts on cigarettes. It's a funny one. I think because they saw my tobacco post I'm drying homegrown tobacco. <laughs> I, know well, I, I think obviously <laughs> yeah of course and again you probably, probably tell people more about the benefits of that. I think it's, it's really important to understand the difference between what you're kind of suggesting with tobacco leaves and, and, and the effects of nicotine and the effects on um, on uh, physiology, particularly NAD and NADH, oxidative and reductive metabolism. Um, but when you were talking about smoking generally, um, because there's quite high levels of cyanides uh, produce cyanosis, uh, that commercial cigarettes is not, not a good way to go. That's the interpretation of this question I'm getting. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think people... Uh, blame the addictive qualities on the tobacco itself and the nicotine itself when I think it's more like the, the chemicals it's usually north of like 20,000 chemicals in the in a cigarette it's, wow is it as much as that wow yeah I, I remember I thought it was about 2,000 but I, I mean I think uh, the old uh, the old uh, image of the film The Insider with Russell Crowe and uh, Al Pacino I think that's a good indication. I think that's a, a, a you know useful to consider how how they've been designed <laughs> to to um, stimulate the addictive response. Uh, but certainly nicotine as itself isn't isn't that addictive, and certainly its restorative effects on NAD uh, and uh, you know uh, resupport of uh, NAD um, and uh, oxidation uh, to maintain uh, physiology is particularly useful. Mm -hmm. um, is rice bran estrogenic? Someone asked. It has vitamin E, doesn't it? A little bit. What was that? Sorry, did you say? Oh, is rice bran estrogenic? I uh, honestly don't know. I don't know everything. I know some things. <laughs> I don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so many different like products and supplements people are taking or food things. It's hard to say. Um, what are your favorite supplements? Someone asked. Um, I, I like methylene blue every now and then. I think it's a really useful supplement. I've, I've seen some wonderful client, some wonderful, uh, client changes with progesterone. I've seen, uh, plenty of female clients who couldn't get pregnant, get pregnant with the use of progesterone and eating efficiently. Uh, I do like, um, thyroid, uh, hormones. I like, uh, uh, Tyromax, which I think is useful. Uh, particularly uh, also Cynomel and Cyno Plus has been particularly useful as well. Um, well, um, I do like pregnenolone as a general restorative hormone. That's something I use uh, now. I'm getting pushing 50 next year, so I need to kind of be looking after myself. Um, so uh, stress non, some of the uh, supplements from um, Idea Labs have been particularly useful for mm -hmm. myself and some clients. Sometimes just general general ones I'll, I'll, I'll look at as well. A, a good B, B vitamin for clients for, for helping with energy. I think cascara has its places. Um, I, I I tend to use a, a standard magnesium sulfate with clients with constipation to get rid of that. And, you know, I, I think constipation, one of those things is actually quite easy to resolve once you get the, the food right. I think even overt hypothyroid people tend to respond really, really well to good food. So food is always going to be the first place. But a magnesium sulfate is particularly useful as well. Um, anything else? Yeah, generally thyroid, progesterone, pregnenolone. Uh, um, 
sometimes a vitamin E. Aspirin, I, I tend to use uh, irregularly throughout the week as well. Now, they're my, my base supplements. Uh, I'm open to using more. It's a, just a, it's a, more of a time and what works with clients. Taurine as well, I think, is quite a useful supplement. Um, that, that's actually a good segue to this one. Thoughts on a vegan diet high in fruit and protein. I think it'd be hard to get protein on a vegan diet. But, yeah, um, I mean, I know taurine is lacking there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Taurine is one. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, invoke a sitting on the fence thing here because there's a, I think it's the head of the vegan society in the UK. He died two or three years ago at the age of 91. So he, he didn't do too badly on it. I mean, oh. I think, I think he, for 40 years he was vegan, but he lived in the Lake District. And if anybody of you know the UK, the Lake District is one of the most stunning places in the UK with miles of lakes, it has its own microclimate. And it's just it's just stunning. There's clean air. It's stress free. And I think to the extent that you can live somewhere like that with zero stress, you can probably get into scrape into your 90s, just like the this guy did. But I think for many, uh, assuming that it's going to be helpful for you when we're in an environment that's quite that's quite polluted, that's quite stressful, getting adequate thyroid hormone. I think the big thing for anyone um uh particularly vegans uh, apart from the obvious uh amino acids and, and proteins that you need to support thyroid physiology muscle turnover and general function is is vitamin a uh and retinol i i've seen such great things with clients with with getting adequate uh liver in the diet from from uh pro uh preformed vitamin a uh and it, it does tend to um i think it does tend to trump the beta carotenoids substantially uh, and if you're hypothyroid too much vitamin a can be a problem and too i think if you look at some of the research from uh 70 odd years ago you could actually decrease hyperthyroidism by giving someone substantial amounts of vitamin a um, equally if you're hypothyroid the the likelihood of you getting an, an excess of vitamin a can occur but generally as a rule of thumb getting adequate kind of liver Perhaps 20 to 30 uh, grams a day can be quite useful or one to two big servings a week. Well, there's some really good liver supplements out there uh, that can be used as well. Um, and I, I think it's just generally protective from, from a skin cancer perspective. It's generally some of the papers, bigger papers have suggested like a at least a 20 percent protection of uh, against skin cancer from those who consume liver than those who don't. I think there are many other aspects involved in that particular um, descriptions, whether it's kind of how much estrogen you have or how much unsaturated fats, how much excess exposure of UV, but generally having adequate um, vitamin A for thyroid hormone conversion, for allowing uh, formation of optimal amounts of iron um, and, and the presentation of anemia, which can be coming from a, a vitamin A or a, a thyroid deficiency is, is particularly useful. So, you know, these are the things that you need to consider. Are you getting enough uh, will beta carotenoids do the job? Well, I think there's still not enough decent research to see what people can get away with. We know there are certain proteins, perhaps like mushrooms, that can provide uh, some types of protein. Your beans and uh, your other kind of uh, foodstuffs like that tend to be not the, the best source. And we know the kind of problems you can get with, with a high amount of those and gas and endotoxin production within within the bowel. So it's... It, I, I think you can get away with it to a degree for some time. Certainly fruit can be protective. I mean, if you look at longevity in the animal kingdom, one of the biggest outliers out of all of the longevity is the, the giant tortoise, which lives up to 150 to 200 years old. And its diet is primarily fruit and, and leaves and can go six months without eating or drinking sometimes. Um, so, you know, there are outliers there. But generally, the, the larger and the more complex the biology, the more requirements for it. Again, there's one other outlier, which is the, the elephant. But again, you're talking maximum of about 70, creeping up to 80 years with the elephant. And that's few and far between. That's not a regular occurrence. Um, but uh, generally, you know, the, the higher the metabolic rate does better with the decreased amount of unsaturated fatty acids. Or that's what the membrane uh, pump theory suggests. I'm glad you brought up uh, retinol because a guest that I've had on the podcast multiple times, Morley Robbins, um, often talks about uh, true vitamin A or retinol. And he says people are obsessed with vitamin D with the sun, but it's more 
important uh, sunlight's reaction with retinol. Um, there's a great study by uh, Ming Zong on uh, retina, retinol, ret um, and the natural history of vitamin A as a light sensor. And um, Morley pretty much says that sunlight activates the breakdown or activates vitamin A into all these breakdown products uh, like opsins, rhodopsin, neuropsin, melanopsin, that are uh, light sensors that have just huge downstream effects on our entire physiology. So that's a good point about uh, the vegan diet. Um, I think the the conversion of beta carotene, I tried to do it for years. I mean, I was like a living experiment. I tried to make it work and I just found my body was not converting beta carotene. Uh, yeah. No matter how much I took. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, and and when you get an abundance of that, you get that your kind of uh, uh, is it hyperkeratosis? I've forgotten the name of it. Hi mm -hmm. Hypercarotenoid or something. Where you get the orangey mm -hmm. fat pads, and that's a pretty good sign that you're either you got you're saturated with it, or your liver just can't convert it. And it's easier for you to 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 saturate the liver with that than it is with your kind of pro, uh, sorry, your preformed vitamin A. So I. I I think you're, you're, you're walking a very tight line of what's, what's optimal and what's not. Uh, and it's, you know, it's pretty easy to get an abundance of the carotenoids, orange juice, even and carrots to a degree, right? Uh, if they're in yeah, and squashes and, and so I've said, I, I, I'm a physical, I was did years of physical therapy and the amount of people that would come in that would have bright orange feet. And I say, you're eating lots of sweet potato, right? And they go, yeah, how do you know? Okay. <laughs> Your feet your feet are bright orange or squash or whatever it was. But yeah, it was pretty easy to tell. That's funny. Yeah. I, I have friends that focus with their clients just mainly on liver health. Um, but I think uh, that could be a useful strategy because a lot of people's livers are messed up. Like I had Georgie on the podcast several times and he was saying that I think two thirds of Americans have liver damage, something as a crazy statistic like that. <laughs> Yeah, and if you look at you, you you look at the kind of data around you know there's these studies that have come out now that said Americans are getting colder, uh, and they're, they're, the reasons are blah 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 blah. But it's like well the thyroid is probably taking a, a, a substantial hit these days. You know, uh, polluted parents are pollu producing polluted offspring. Uh, thyroid expression is substantially decreased. Therefore, liver function is going to be substantially decreased. And we know that in, in, in low thyroid function, the liver slows down from a functional perspective, whether it's kind of mobilization of cholesterol, ability to, to metabolize glucose, uh, the uh, accumulation of unsaturated fatty acids in the liver, uh, the presence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You know, and you, again, study after study that when you make people euthyroid, uh, that there's a, a significant change to fatty acid, uh, fatty acid, uh, NAFLD. Uh, and so, you know, there are, there are some issues where we can improve the diet, but again, restoring thyroid function can ensure that you can utilize vitamin A efficiently. And I certainly think that, you know, I think there's a, a few negative people, is it like Garrett Smith is one of them. Yeah. You ever heard of him? He's always bashing vitamin A. And I think, a lot of these people are bashing vitamin A without really understanding the effects of uh, how many tens of millions of people in the, in the US are hypothyroid. So if you can't convert and utilize uh, uh, vitamin A efficiently, well, then you're going to show up as having an abundance of it that, that might be causing responses that might look like there's ongoing inflammation, might go, you know, altered cholesterol, blood glucose values. Yeah, uh, electron transport chain issues, mitochondrial dysfunction, all of these are going to uh, flag up because you're not actually hitting the, the, the key driver, which is low thyroid function. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, someone asked to touch on the subject of thyroid in relation to EMFs, uh, radiation, and 5G. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I think it's useful to consider that, you know, a lot of people running around who were saying that coronavirus was caused by 5G, which it clearly is not. However, I, th I think when people were running around doing that, they managed to undermine the, the precautionary principles that should be being observed at the moment. And there are a quite a few, not quite a few, there are emerging studies that show that thyroid physiology, much like the studies that have been shown on in uh, rodents on reproductive tissues, is the tissue that's suffering when we're exposing body to external radiation electromagnetic frequencies there's several studies that show that tsh increases with mobile phone use 
you understand when you're on your phone here there's obviously a, a heating effect and you have many glands around here but the thyroid gland is pretty close to that and when you start to increase exposure to any kind of uh whether it's a heating whether it's a strong enough uh frequency to penetrate skin tissue then we are going to be seeing problems associated with that and i think that 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 that's something that was quite frustrating because you had a number of people that were able to discount what people have actually been suggesting is a precautionary principle when it comes to looking at electromagnetic frequencies and thyroid physiology. But again, if you go look at reproductive tissue, uh, oxidative stress, which is induced above and beyond of what it should be when it's exposed to uh, high EMFs, and it's there in 2G, 3G, 4G, it's going to be there in 5G because if, if you've got the lower frequencies that are associated with increased oxidative stress and increased tissue uh, thyroid tissue morphology, perhaps the increase in the presence of nodules or um, at least uh, thyroid hyperplasia, which will be a product of increasing TSH levels. Uh, when you're getting reduced um, conversion of T4 to T3, when you're in an environment that's quite polluted and already has an excess of the pollutants like bisphenols, like PCBs, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is the airborne pollutants, which act like estrogens. All of these things, when combined, do not look good from a longitudinal research. I kind of said many years ago to some people that I think EMF stuff will be kind of the, the smoking of, of, of future generations because it's becoming more ubiquitous. There are higher frequencies. There's a flooding everywhere. It's pretty hard to get away from it. You know, if you're in an, an urban environment, you switch on your phone, you've got 10 to 15 different Wi-Fi signals coming in. So nobody's looking at the research where they're combining the, um, you know, the composite effects of increased pollution, increased EMF signals. Uh, and I think when you look at that, it's going to be quite problematic in the long term, although it's quite, it's quite hard study to, to, to design to look at that. Um, something I'm, I'm i'm toying around with but i'm not sure yet it's possible to do yeah a few weeks ago i had my friend uh beverly on the podcast and she's um really really sensitive to emfs she gets like rashes and gets really itchy and she believes that her high iron cause she has hemochromatosis is con a big contributor that that the iron and the metals are pretty much making her an antenna and uh i think that's often a missing piece too uh, especially the high iron, just from iron fortified foods that we grew up eating and the water and just, just bathing the body in iron. Um, that's definitely, uh, I think contributes to the EMF issue harming us more. <laughs> well, there's certainly lots of research on the accumulation of heavy metals and, you know, things like cadmium, mercury, which have a, a significant effect on thyroid uh, physiology by decreasing uh, the conversion of the deodinases and the selenoproteins and how thyroid hormone is converted. So if we extend that to accumulation in tissues, um, we know that mercury has become more ubiquitous. We know that there are other metals. We know that it's easy to get iron overload these days, as you said. So um, I think it, there's, there's a lot of research on magnetic fields that goes back to the 40s and 50s by someone called Madeline Barnathy. Um, it's actually um, a reference that, that Ray P talked about when he... Uh, he went off to Russia back in the, the 60s, I think it was, or the 70s, I can't remember. But there's her book has showed that, you know, it, it, magnetic fields should be considered as a form of stress because there's a certain frequency that has some quite catabolic effects on the body. Now, how much metal someone's accumulated could be a, a pertinent factor. How you assess that, whether you go and look at something like porphyrin levels or uh, whether you look at kind of blood tests like hemochromatosis, obviously an obvious one because there's high iron there. And I think they're very sensitive studies and subjective with subjective nuances to to get some concrete research on that. And that's why probably a lot of mainstream researchers probably wouldn't give that much thought. But it's certainly an issue and it can't be discounted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, let's see. This is probably a good final question. Uh how to drive energy into the cell. Um, I don't know if that's how it works. Uh, basically how to make the cell produce energy. <laughs> but, well, I think it comes, come, comes back to the concept of best working order, which a lot of people talk about, you know, uh, maintaining the aerobic system. We've talked about how methyl in blue can restore the electron transport chain, mm -hmm. uh, preventing something called proton leak, 
Uh, how do you do that? Well, you make sure you don't accumulate too much unsatur unsaturated fatty acids. Uh, you make sure that the antioxidant status at the kind of cell and the cell membrane as such is maintained. How do you do that? Adequate thyroid hormone. Um, you uncouple every now and then by using aspirin, which is, is shown to do some wonderful things. Uh, make sure you get adequate energy. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people, there's some criticisms, criticisms with type of dieting where you're eating, say, every three, three hours or so. I, I see that as a useful stress reduction strategy initially. There's no reason why people can't get back to eating three squares a day if that's what's, what's good for them. But initially, if you're in a stress state, you're kind of prone to dipping in and out of low blood sugar states or you can't regulate liver production uh, or, you know, um, regulation of glucose and, and your energetics because your cells aren't functioning appropriately. The easiest thing to do is eat on a regular basis. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to overeat. And weight gain isn't always a necessarily a uh, consequence of eating reg on a regular basis. Um, so it does depend on each person, but maintaining energy, getting adequate sunlight, you know, getting exposure to, to the other rays beyond UV, like red light, for example, is shown to be particularly useful. Enhancing adaptive compounds like pregnenolone, methylene blue, ensuring thyroid, as I've said a, a few times. You know, these are just some of the things that we can do to ensure that the aerobic system is functioning efficiently. Should people, you know, use use other modalities? Well, it depends on how flexible they are. But to the extent that you've been kind of running around trying different modalities and you can't sleep, you're moody, you've got no libido, you you kind of digestive system shot, you know, is to the extent that you need some, some kind of platform to work from. So the best thing you can do to enhance energy production you good utilization of glucose is to kind of give it what it needs and, and most people need regular energy um, and then when you start seeing the processes come back the ability to perhaps go a bit longer without eating sleep through the night not waking up for a pee no menstrual cramps no irritability good libido not not biting people's heads off every time you see them. You know, there's a good sign that it's starting to work. And, and to, to get that, you've got to start with the foundation of perhaps eating on a regular basis and not going going for these kind of uh, reduced mechanisms that perhaps like calorific restriction or intermittent fasting, which will have a, a restrictive effect and aren't necessarily going to push you in the right direction. So the answer is to, to maintain uh, energy and to optimize energy. So that the cells will, will utilize energy efficiently uh, when they're given the capacity to. And it might be understanding your environment, environment a bit more, it might be upregulating thyroid, getting enough vitamin A, getting enough sunlight, moving efficiently, uh, doing the right type of exercise that doesn't suppress and, and batter your physiology down. Because you know that's what a lot of people are being convinced to do, that they need to still work harder and eat less. And for, for most people, that's pushing them into a hole. That's awesome. Um, Keith, do you, have, do you have time for one more question? This is a good one. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, awesome. Um, is there a limit to fructose per day? Someone says currently getting around 100 grams from fruit, honey, juice, etc. Um, I think that's a common question. I, I, like, I think can it, I, yeah, yeah I, I think it's totally subjective, Matt. I mean, you know, you, you see some people can do really, really well on, on 70% carbohydrate diets um, and do really, really well. Um, I think it just depends on on how, how it works for you. D does your bowel function well with it? Do you feel that um, with adequate protein and fats and, and, and pro uh, sorry, yeah, adequate protein and fats, you can you can get the ratio. Sometimes just playing around with the ratio. Some people might do better on a, a uh, you know, uh, sucrose fructose mix or just even getting starchier foods like spuds potatoes in tubers that kind of thing as well so i i i really do think it's quite subjective i i tend to have plenty of fruit in a day and you know from various fruit sources uh, i to be honest i'm not as meticulous about looking at, at measuring foods and and that's not generally how i work with clients i'm looking at them to take control of stuff and and explore what works for them. So I, I'm not so if you ever come on board and work with me, I'm not someone who's saying you need to have 50 grams of this or 60 grams of that. It's kind of exploring a, a, a how food works for you. Um, generally, I might say, you know, let's start off with a 20% fat, 40% protein, 40% carbs and see how we get on and then play around with it. 
So the fruits, the food sources, when it comes to specific carbohydrate levels, it, it tends to be quite an individual thing, uh, and uh, it, it's just an in it depends question. That's awesome. Well, uh, Keith, that was a, that was a lot of info. I think people are going to get a lot out of this, and um, I think what you're sharing about the thyroid is great because uh, I remember I used to think about the thyroid and just think of herbal formulas. And, you know, you see these little supplements where it's like thyroid support and it might, it usually has iodine in there, which can be harmful for the thyroid <laughs> and yeah, I've seen, all these herbs. Yeah. And, and, yeah, yeah I've seen a client recently <laughs> who was taking an abundance of a seafood supplement uh, and then another supplement. There was obviously too much iodine and she was starting to get some uh, swelling of the, of the thyroid gland kind of since stopping it seemed to, to have a, a very positive effect. But yeah, I, 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 sorry, I think I cut you off there. Sorry. No, that's fine. Yeah, I just think it's um, people aren't looking in the right place and they're looking uh, once again for supplements as the, as the, as the kind of the foundation um, to support their, their glandular health or their organ health. And um, it's really all the other things you were talking about, um, not skipping breakfast, not over exercising, not, you know, kind of getting out of that stress hamster wheel kind of state. Um, it should be like one of the first steps uh, instead of taking like thyroid herbs, which can make things worse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to start with changing nutrition. And I think that has to be the, the main foundation for everybody. If you start going and waiting and saying you need thyroid hormone because you're cold and or you blah, blah, blah. It, it's possible that you may need some, but to the extent you're not eating, supporting the body, having a regular energy intake, it can backfire on you for sure. Um, and it, like I said, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be for life. It might just be to the environment that you're in. It might be that the thyroid just needs some support. But I, I do genuinely believe that restoring thyroid function is, is one of the most holistic things that can be done because it permeates every single level of function. Uh, and when you're living in an environment that's restricting the amount of T4 that's being converted to T3, for me, it could be a no brainer. But obviously, I would go months, first of all, checking all the other things that we can do before we even need to consider that. That's awesome. Well, um, I think your Instagram's awesome. Um, they could find you at uh, Tomo Littlewood. I'll put the, put the link in the notes yeah. and your website, uh, Balanced Body Mind. Uh, you have, uh, you have some blogs up there and uh, membership, coaching. Um, so definitely, definitely check out uh, Keith's work. And um, Thanks, man, for coming on. That was a lot of fun. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It's uh, good to answer some nice questions. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to do it again. And um, please stick around uh, while I close out the show. Thanks, Keith. That is it for today's show. What do you guys think about that? Thyroid hormone permeates every level of cell function. That is a really important point to get that most people don't. And if people don't get that, then they go on a keto carnivore diet. They'll skip breakfast. They'll restrict sugar slash carbohydrate. And they're headed down a one-way street as my former guest, Danny Roddy's put it. It's a one-way street that leads to self-destruction. And so this information is really about long-term health because you can feel great going on a fad diet or on an extremely restrictive diet. You'll feel all right for a little bit, but it'll eventually catch up to you and it'll specifically catch up with your thyroid. And if the thyroid hormone, not only production, but conversion, transport, and utilization has to be there for your cells to generate energy, for you to generate proper ATP. So I believe that that is a primary cause of disease. If someone's obese, they're not eating too much food. They're being starved of food. They don't have enough energy. And so their metabolic rate is slow. And so they get fat. They get, gain weight. They can't lose weight. That is all a symptom of having a slow metabolism. And 
people are all about weight loss and they go on these 10 day MLM green powder anabolic fasts or whatever, these little hyped things, whether you use products that promise fast weight loss, but it really comes from healing your metabolism. It's, it's a long process. And you can lose weight immediately in unhealthy ways. People do that with hard drugs all the time. But you will gain it back. That's the unfortunate part with those quick fixes. So you have to be in it for the long haul. You have to realize that every part of the body is connected. And your metabolism does run the show. And if you're anti-sugar, then you are anti-metabolism. And you're not going to have that internal fire to keep your body temperature up, to keep your thyroid functioning, and to be healthy overall. You really need that active T3 thyroid hormone for proper cellular function. That's really what it comes down to. And I think Keith really broke down why that is. So you can check him out at balancedbodymind.com. He has a really great website. A ton of blog posts, different sections, energy and digestion, hormones, nutrition, his little sleep seminar, even has stuff on neck pain, back pain, breathing disorders, all sorts of awesome stuff. And he even has a little uh, coaching and membership area if you want to work with Keith. Um, he is based in Dubai, but he works with people around the globe. So if you're interested in working with him, you can just head over to his website and click the uh, membership tab. And he has video courses up. He does one-on-one -on -one coaching and a 10-week program to help educate people about these concepts. I really think we need more people sharing this information. Because I look at big social media accounts and it's just the same stuff over and over and over again. It's starvation, it's keto, it's sugar is bad. And even if they do talk about PUFAs, which is starting to permeate the carnivore community, polyunsaturated fatty acids being toxic, there's no talk of lipofuscin or of iron overload. And... I really believe that if someone's not drinking pristine water, then they'll be missing a big piece of the puzzle, which is the acid, iron, and calcium overload that comes from drinking spring water, which is what all these people promote. Or if they do promote filtered water, it's this deuterium-depleted water, this really expensive water in plastic, no, you just get a pristine hydro travel system. You can put it under the counter and it'll change your life. It's acid-free, contaminant-free, bicarbonate-rich. I did an episode all about water. If you want to go check that out, I also have YouTube videos about it on my Matt Blackburn YouTube channel. I really think water is the foundation and people like to focus on all these other things that are really out there while they're bathing and drinking essentially tap water. It just doesn't make sense at all. So check out the Pristine Hydro travel system. I have a discount code BLACKBURN. I bought that when I was living with my parents several years ago, hooked it up in the bathroom, and I have never been the same ever since. It absolutely changed my life. It's real water. It's what water used to be. And now everyone is on an acid trip and they are bicarbonate deficient. And if you do sodium bicarbonate, you can get sodium poisoning. So it's really about understanding the magnesium burn rate, oxidative stress from excess PUFAs and estrogen and iron, which causes lipofuscin, which is the root cause of all disease. And it's part of my CLF protocol. Really understanding these things, what's causing that fire, that extreme oxidative stress and that extreme magnesium burn rate. So just getting the magnesium in, especially through the water in liquid form, that is a way to immediately put out the fire while you work on the 
long-term aspects of what got you there. So a little update about MitoLife, the Purely K product. If you're listening to this show on Friday, August 28th, it will be back next Tuesday. So that's September 1st. And I'm actually increasing the amount of capsules per bottle. If some of you are megadosing the vitamin K27, metaquinone 7 like myself, then you could buy the 120 count bottle and enjoy megadosing your Purely K. So that'll be back next Tuesday on September 1st. And the vitamin E will be back hopefully that following week. That's the estimated date, but stay tuned on my Instagram and I'll announce uh, when that's coming out. But it'll be the beginning of September. Appreciate you waiting patiently for the Pufa Protect to be back. It's going to be an upgraded formula with mixed tocopherols. And there's so much misinformation about vitamin E. I'll have to do a whole episode on it. There's people saying that tocotrienols are better than tocopherols. That is absurd because the liver makes alpha ttp for a reason and it has a strong affinity for d alpha tocopherol so people say oh that's the one that they studied and so that's the one that everyone says is important to supplement well yeah it is (laughs) but there's also gamma which is going to be in my supplement but tocotrienols those are not essential You can get those from rice, sprouted rice powder. I take that from Shen Blossom. But you really don't need to supplement tocotrienols. It's the tocopherols that we need because lipid peroxidation is the problem. And most people taking vitamin E are countering it with omega-3 supplements or cold water seafood pescatarian diets, which is just as bad as omega-3 supplements. So it's really about throwing away your omega-3 supplement, adding in vitamin E, and limiting your seafood. Unless it's warm water fish or shellfish once a week like oysters. The uh, benefits there outweigh the detriment. And as always, if you want to support the show, you can go to matt-blackburn.com. I just posted a new blog there all about Shilajit, and I linked my video to my Shilajit series. I sell purified... Shilajit tablets that help to reverse iron overload and help with multiple other aspects of health. It helps with mineral balance, copper imbalance, copper deficiency, which is a big issue, bioavailable copper. That's contained in MitoLife Panacea. And that fulvic acid in the whole food supplement, in the resin, you don't want to take isolated fulvic because that'll eat your bones. The whole food supplement of purified shilajit resin is a panacea for health. There's no part of human physiology that it doesn't touch because it's acting on the mineral level. And it's giving you 84 plus carbon bonded organic minerals. You also have DPPs, the alpha benzopyrones, and many other substances that are fascinating that have huge beneficial effects on the body. So thanks so much for listening. There's a new episode that was released every Friday. If you're new to the show, go back and listen to all the previous shows. That's usually what people do because there's a lot of information packed in there that can really help you to improve your health. Today's quote is by Broda Barnes from the book Hypothyroidism. The Unsuspected Illness, 1976. A young housewife who feels run down, tires easily, is sleepy much of the time, and strangely oversensitive to cold weather. A victim of severe, recurrent headaches. A barren couple. A child or adult, unusually prone to infections, particularly respiratory, but not limited to them. A sufferer from severe, rheumatic pain, and a potential heart attack victim. At least one man or woman in a state of severe mental depression. These are a few of the people who will pass through my waiting room on almost any routine day. There is one striking common fact about them. Varied as there are their symptoms, the cause of their illness in every case is the same. 
low thyroid function.